Welcome to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. My name is Lee Davy. I'm not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I'm someone who doesn't drink alcohol. I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same, including right now talking to Andy. How are you doing, Andy? Good, and yourself, Lee? Absolutely fantastic. Ah, it's a lie. I was going to say fantastic. <laughs> Do you know what, Andy? My back killing. I've been on mm-hmm. this chair mm-hmm. recording videos for our taster that, that I've been mm-hmm. creating uh, this month and for every month there. On uh, this laptop is on an ironing board. Yeah. Uh, I have a daughter downstairs absolutely screaming blue murder mm-hmm. for her dad. Um, so, yeah, I'm feeling all right, although there's a few challenges in there as well. <laughs> if it's any consolation, I am on IKEA furniture, which is not doing me any better. No. So no. I'm screaming. My legs are, my legs are howling from the, from the pain. And you, you're on um, vacation right now. Tell us where you are. We are presently about two and a half hours outside of Montreal, west of Montreal, near Ottawa, so the, the nation's capital. We're on the Ottawa River on the Quebec side. So the Ottawa River separates Quebec and Ottawa. Ontario is just on the other side. I could see it today through the fog. In a chalet and uh, enjoying every minute of it. Ah, oh, good, good. So it's, it's fantastic here. It's so quiet. We might have six cars that pass us a day and otherwise we're just having a great time relaxing. That's what I need. A little bit different to the vacations you would have experienced when you were someone who drank alcohol, I imagine. Very much so. This time last year, we were in Mexico for two weeks. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and the first, the first day we were, I was in the pool, and it was a huge, it was a huge pool, and there must have been fifty or sixty vacationers from, I would say, your part of the world. I don't want to single anybody out, but they had the music going, and from ten o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night, pounding, pounding, pounding you know, one after another, females, males, everybody. And the kids were, were sober running around, almost half drowning. The parents didn't know anything. And it sobered me up, even though I was sober. I, I remember being in Cancun with uh, my cousin Craig, and it was very early in the day, and we were sat by the pool, and there was some Americans playing volleyball in, in the pool, you know, really knocking it back large. And I turned around, and, and uh, one of them shouted to the guy by the bar, Hey, throw us a beer, mate, or something, mm. uh, or dude. Hey, throw us a beer, dude. And he threw him a mm. can. And I remember yeah. saying to my mate Craig, wow, the, these Americans are polite. If, if that would have been a, a pool in Blackpool in the UK, we would have said, oh, throw us a fucking beer, you twat. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, I mean. And the, kids, and the kids too, get us a beer for your mum and dad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my God, my mum used to write me notes. Um, please give my son 20 uh, silk cut and, uh, uh, and, a, and a bottle of wine because you, you, weren't, you weren't allowed to have him those days. I, I, my mother would send me, I was 10 years old. It, their the corner stores, the corner shops are called Depeners in Quebec. She, and they sell beer, wine. Um, yeah, beer and wine, no hard, uh, hard spirits. She would send me at 10 years old to go and get a case of beer for her. This was normal practice. The neighbors yeah. would say, here's 25 cents, go and get me some beer or wine, you know? It's crazy. It's, um, it's changed. It's changing. And, and yet, um, your, your experience growing up at a younger mm. age was vastly different to mine, right? And the, cause I, I, you, cause you're always saying in, 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 in Strive, oh, wow, I'm so glad I don't live in the culture that you live in the UK type of thing, or I haven't experienced yeah. that culture. T- tell us a little bit about your thoughts around that. Why, why, why are they so different? Why weren't you knocking it down you when you was a teenager compared to us? Because I, I, I had alcoholic parents uh, that abused each other. And um, I, my, my, my mother and father separated when I was uh, two and a half. I grew up with my mother. My brother grew up with my father uh, because he was a bit of a handful. And they didn't change their habits. What ended up happening after they separated is my mother went into a deep depression, which lasted. She was still on medication until the day she died. And I grew up hating what it did to her and uh, what it did to my father. My father would, he was, he's a German man. So he would get up every day at 5 a.m. He would have all of his chores done before 10 a.m. 
And then he would start drinking at noon and he wouldn't stop until he went to bed at 7.30. Mm. My mother, on the other hand, would drink the whole day. She was tremendously loving, but she was a, an alcoholic and it had such a profound effect on me that I, I hated, I hated the alcohol and I, I, I hated, I didn't, I won't say I hated her, but I hated what it did to her. Mm. She wasn't, she was the most loving person in the world to the day she died, but she wasn't um, the best uh, mother at times. Mm. And I grew up seeing that and saying, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to let it affect me that way. It's, this is ridiculous how, how it can affect somebody and, and, and there's, change somebody so dramatically to the point where they're mixing alcohol and medication and not waking up at times for, it, it, I could be shaking her when I was 11 years old for, for an hour and she wouldn't wake up and I, I hated it. So I grew up in that environment. Uh, we were extremely poor, food baskets, uh, you know, throughout the year. Uh, the love was always there, but nothing else was. And I just hated it. And uh, from, from about 14, 16 years old, I was involved in school, but I, I, never, I never liked school. Um, I had a really hard time with education. Um, I think I'm an intelligent person, but I didn't fit in in the, in, in the classroom whatsoever. So I would play sports and I would slack off everywhere else throughout life. But sports was my mainstay. And then I started to, to train at the gym. I didn't touch alcohol until I was um, 30 years old. Wow. Mar married. Married, and then I started drinking because the because the marriage was having uh, issues. Wow, that that is quite incredible. I, I've referred to you as an outlier before, but I'm going to mm. say it again. You know, that kind of bucks the trend of everything that I talk about and the philosophy of the tube about alcohol in terms of how we are programmed from birth to drink alcohol, but also it shows the existence of the belief system, no matter how old you are that you, mm. can, you can get through to the age of 30 without it touching you. And then you start and boom, you just can't stop. I mean, it's crazy. It, it, it started off as um, a beer and then it, it ended up being uh, vodka and then it went back to beer and then it was five liters of beer a night. I don't know, it was, it was ridiculous. And up until the end uh, last year in June when I stopped, it, was, uh, it became three bottles of uh, wine a night you know, just to turn off my thoughts and turn off or escape the pain. Go, going back to your childhood and you're, you're someone who's not drinking alcohol. Mm. When, I, when I grew up in a very small valley of 3,000 people, it was very black and white. Like mm. you, you was a drinker or you weren't. And that meant that you had certain attributes or you didn't. Uh, you were sporty if you drank, you were cool if you drank, you were sexy if you drank, you were, you were in that group where there was X amount of men, X, uh, X amount of girls, X amount of boys, and you would all, you know, share each other at certain points of your time over like five or six years. But then there was this other group and, and your results and your exam results would be terrible. And then there was this yeah. other group of people who would get A, straight A's. Um, they would none of them would have girlfriends or boyfriends. Uh, none of them would be playing sports and none of them would do anything other than get bullied. Um, you know, and what, they weren't the drinkers. They weren't the drinkers or the drug takers or the smokers. I mean, so, yeah. so for me, like the push and the, the push to not to avoid being in that group yeah. was, uh, was, 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 was one of the factors for me. Uh, what was it like for you not drinking being a kid? I, uh, because I was poor, because uh, I, I, I didn't have the, 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 the latest clothes, I didn't have much of anything. I grew up on the, as an outlier to the community as well. I, I grew up um, looked down upon, you know, so I didn't have friends. Um, I went through school and, and because I, I, the environment at home was so uh, bad, I didn't fit in at school either. So I actually, I played up to the fact that I was a weirdo, you know, uh, I didn't dress weird, but I just, I guess that's how I am today is I don't care because I was, 
I was always shunned, you know? Um, I have a good personality. I get on with people very easily, and I, it would have been the case as, as a teenager. But teenagers don't think that way. You either are in or you're out, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, one, it's one of the lessons that I'm... I've been talking about it this week in some podcasts that I haven't released yet, and I'm going to be incorporating it in the Truth About Alcohol Intensive, you know? It's like uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, mm. who's Canadian, yeah. who, who, who you either like him or you hate him. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been reading his book, The, the 12, 12 Rules of Life. Yeah, and the first one is uh, Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back. Mm-hmm. And, and, that, and that's what I, and I, want to, I want to introduce a caveat here because uh, I don't want all you people who hate Jordan Peterson to just turn it off right now. Um, look, okay. Someone like Jordan Peterson, you can hate him or not, whatever. But if he comes up with a good point and a good solid point, irrespective of what his views are on politics mm-hmm. and feminism and all that kind of stuff, if he makes a good point like, hey, go for life with you standing up straight with your shoulders yep. back, yep. you should be able to use that, folks, right? And I think, I think what Andrew's saying here is something worth exploring because if you're, if you're used to being beaten up at home, and I don't mean physically here, Andrew, um, mm-hmm. and you're, not get, you're not getting the love and attention that you want. Um, and then you go to school and you're not going to be feeling like you're high up on this dominance hierarchy. You're going to mm-hmm. feel like you're down the bottom of the rung. And if you're down the bottom of the rung, no matter what kind of animal you are, there is more pain and suffering down there. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we don't want that. And it's the same when it comes to alcohol. You know, it's, it's, it's whether or not you're going to make that decision to to uh, tell your friends or your family that you're not drinking, you know, if you go towards them with standing up straight with your shoulders back, they're not going to give you any shit. But if you go at them feeling like you're somehow low down on the dominance hierarchy, like your status is somehow lower or you're a low human being with no self-compassion, they're going to take the piss out of you and they're going to ridicule you and they're going to push you into drinking, you know, thoughts mm-hmm. on that, Andrew? It's, it's, it's all a matter of fitting in. It's all a matter of being part of the tribe, you know, and, um, we're, we're experiencing that, especially today with social media, with life in general, you either are, are part of the tribe or you are on the fringes and people that are on the fringes are, are still looked down upon. Um, we're, we're opening up as, as a community, as, as, as the world is opening up, we're becoming more liberal. But um, I find that it's also pushing people into little pockets. Everybody is now being pushed into little pockets. And uh, it's, I don't think it's ever going to change. Like, you know, there's always going to be, you're either fitting in or you're not. And I didn't fit in. I chose not to fit in. Um, and I don't think it's hurt me. You know? I have a lot of pain, uh, but that was yesterday. And we have to live in the moment and we have to look forward. We can't look back and, and cry. That's my philosophy. My, mine is, is similar. So I came from a very poor background. I didn't have anything that the other kids had. And, but my relationship with not fitting in is a perverse one because initially – not understanding why the kids were calling me chinky China man and all these things. And, and then learning from my mother that my father wasn't my real father and my, my biological father was from Hong Kong and that I actually was half Chinese suddenly cast me as a seven year old as being completely different to everybody where I lived. Right. And I hated being different, but, and then I, and I fought against it and I, I really wanted to fit in. But then later as I got older, I, loved being different because of my ego maybe i don't know but so there's a love hate i can see how it brought me a lot of pain a lot of suffering but also it it allowed me to increase my status again or in the dominance mm. hierarchy and to live a better life you know but do we do we ever really fit in i mean how many people can you count on your hands that you're truly close to you know, it's, it's, it's a facade. No, it, my, my, mine's, 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 yeah, you're talking one hand. Yeah. Hmm. And, and, and this is it. And so we're striving, we're striving, we're striving to just fit in and to roll with the crowd and to, ah, oh, yeah, shit, I got to have it. I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to, you know, I got to, got to, got to, got to. You don't have to. It doesn't, 
realistically, it doesn't really enrich your life. Enriching your life comes from, 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 for me, comes from learning. It comes from engaging, being of service to others, from growing every day. This is what I've learned, especially since I've become sober, is I am of service. I am present. I am in the moment for the people around me. But I just, I guess I've been jaded and I know I see the world. He never really fit in. It's just a, a bunch of acquaintances and we're social, we're nice, we're friendly to each other. But uh, how many people really let you in? Mm. Or, 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 or how many people are you willing to let in? Let in, I mean, exactly. We, we, we don't really have the time or the mental capacity to have... Mm. Here's, here's a funny thing. Like when we're drinkers... Mm. It's, all, it's almost like we're surrounded by so many people. Like, so people say, oh, do you know what, Lee? Um, I don't really, I'm really worried about what's going to happen when I start drinking because none of my, I'm going to lose all my friends and they won't like me anymore, like blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But in truth, what's happening is you look around you and you've got a lot of real surface level interaction, or a lot of surface level friendships. And, and I mean surface level in a, in a number of different ways. One, in terms of the kind of stuff you're talking about. And, yeah. and two, something that come up uh, th this week, uh, I wrote uh, um, uh, a blog post and, and did a podcast on it called Friends, right? So I remember when I first stopped drinking alcohol, um, my cousin Craig, who was the best man at my first wedding and, and someone who I loved dearly, I told him over the phone that I was quitting my 19-year job on the railway to become someone uh, to, to, at the time it was to write about poker and be a professional poker player yeah. whilst f kind of getting the time and the money to create two for alcohol. And I'll never forget what he said. Yeah. He turned around and said to me, um, you're a fucking idiot. I've read your stuff and it's fucking shit. Yeah. Now um, I know, I know that deep down he's doing that because he's trying to scare me into staying on the railway. So his motivation is to help me. But the question here is, do you want to surround yourselves with friends who believe that is a strategy worthy of even trying? Mm -hmm. You don't, do you? Yeah. No, no, you don't. It's, it's, you want to be around people who enrich you as a person. And if you're around people that, drag you down through no fault of their own because that's just how they grew up. I mean, we grew up in such different cultures, but you don't want to be around people that bring you down. Essentially, you don't win in the end. You don't win in the end. So, it, but it's hard to find people that, 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 you know, edify you, that lift you up, that, that, that bring you to, to feeling that higher purpose. And that's what we have here at Strive. And that's why, it's such a it's such a fundamental and and good thing to have as part of my life, anyways. You know, I mean, it's I I like I would challenge that statement a little bit in as much as I don't think it's I don't think it's difficult to find the people we need to find to enrich our lives when we're ready for it. I mm -hmm. think I think they're out there. Like there are seven point three billion people. I I just read uh, today that the numbers of drinkers in the UK between 18 and 26 or somebody's dropped by 30%, for example. So, nice. so there are, there are less and less people uh, are drinking, particularly younger people. Right. Mm. Uh, but, but we only have to look around at the yoga studios and uh, the juice bars and the vegan cafe. We can see that people are starting to take health a little bit more seriously. I think the people are out there. What is stopping us is our fear of stepping out of our comfort zone and, yeah. And going up to somebody. So I could go up to you, Andrew, in a shop, feel your vibe and say, hey, can I have your phone number so um, we can meet up and have a coffee? I can't be honest. There's a part of me that goes all the way back to when I was a kid that yeah. thinks, thinks a little bit homophobic if I'm going up to you saying, can I have your number? I'm being honest. That, and, that I, yeah. People would have called me gay. What, are you a gay boy because you're asking Andrew Free's phone number? And back then as a kid, and this is really important that I make this distinction so you don't attack me on social media of being a homophobe, people. When you're a kid, that's how you think. You were terrified as a male to be um, categorized as being anything Labels. but mm -hmm. alpha male. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's, that's going back to, to my days of, of, of being uh, an outcast in school. I went from being the weird kid 
to growing into a, a large individual and I became a bully and I inflicted hurt on people, you know? Um, so yeah, I see, I see what you're saying 100%. It's the way it is, you know? But we have to try and make a change slowly. It's gonna come about. It, it will come about, but it's gonna take time. You know? I mean, these, these relationships that we're making on Strive, for example, we're sharing things on Strive about ourselves and having conversations that we've likely never had before. Or, you know, you might have had them with Patricia or I, I have them with Liza, but, uh, and my ex-wife probably. But outside of that uh, small group of people, you know, not very often. So yeah. we're building a muscle, if you like. We're learning to be radically honest and open and transparent. So when we do uh, bump into... Uh, the right person at the yoga studio or in Starbucks or at a convention that we're at, that we're more comfortable to talk about it. And yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's what makes Strive uh, pretty cool. I got, I got to be honest, you know? It's, it's from day one, the community has been um, one like I've never seen before. I mean, we're, we're there for each other. We actually support each other. We actually encourage each other and help each other, which you don't find on social media. You know, there's not been, since I've been doing this for over a year now, I haven't found any negative comments or negativity that permeates throughout. We're so positive and that will attract people. It's, it's like a light to a light to a moth, a moth to a light. Uh, a light, light to a moth. I know what you're saying. Yeah. And, so. and at the same time that we're supportive of each other as well, we're also, we're also able to call each other out. We're also able to say, Hey, I don't think you should be using that self deprecating language or um, I'm not quite sure I agree with what you're saying here. I mean, a lot of that happens, you know, uh, I think that is super important in a community as well. Something that I yeah. I've had to learn uh, particularly, um, okay. but but going back to so going back to the first time you started drinking, what what was going on in your life then, Andrew? I was married to a lady. Um, I was raising. Uh, she had two children from a previous marriage. Um, when I met her, she was in law school. Um, she couldn't support herself, so she came to live with me. I eventually, the two kids who were with the grandmother came to live with me. I was 30 years old. I had never grown up until that point. I was still, I was a child. Um, so my whole world changed and I went to, we got married. Two kids are with us. I started working two full-time jobs just to support the family. And uh, the marriage wasn't a good one. We didn't get on. We never, we never really uh, meshed. So started to drink to sleep, you know, that, that old bullshit line we feed each other. Um, and then I started to drink to just numb out the chronic pain that I was feeling in terms of the heartache. Can I just stop you there a second yeah. though? So you've gone from someone who said, I'm never fucking drinking again. I hate it. I hate it. It's never happened. I'm never going to turn into my mom and dad. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you get into this relationship and it's difficult. <clears throat> How do you even know that alcohol is going to help you sleep? I what? tried alcohol. Right, right. So, so at some <laughs> point, <me> out. <laughs> at some point, it must have introduced itself into your life, minus the drama, right? Must have. <clears throat> I would say when I was twenty-eight years old, I was living by myself in a in a in a little studio apartment. I bought a case of beer, and I think that case of beer lasted me eight months. It was twenty-four beers. I right. just have the beer to relax because that's what people do, don't they? Right. And, but honestly, it was when I was, when I was married, it was, I wanted to escape. I mean, I was at work from seven, I was out of the house at 6.30 a.m. I was back at home by 11.30 p.m. I just wanted to escape. And on the weekends, on, on the one day that I would have off, I just wanted to escape. And that was the quickest way to escape. I w I've never taken drugs. I wouldn't take drugs, you know, um, I'm afraid. So I'm a big scaredy cat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I get you. But alcohol is alcohol is accepted, right? So why not? Okay, boom! I go to the store, I get myself some beer, and then there's a depot. I get myself a big vat of uh, vodka, and vodka works even better, you know. But it just tore me down. And then when the marriage ended, after about the five year mark, I I escaped to Vancouver. I drove across the country, escaped to Vancouver, 
and um, just I was in a shit state, sorry to swear, but I was in a shit state and I just drank, it compounded. I just drank and drank. And you know what? I never drank during the day. I never did. I only drank at nighttime. I never drank around people. So this is me being a weirdo, I guess. I don't know, but I never drank around people. And the volume just increased, increased, increased until last year in June. And I said, I need to make a change. I need to change my life. This is ridiculous. My anxiety is getting, I couldn't even cross a bridge because I was, I was having shakes and I was afraid. I was afraid I was going to pass out and um, have a seizure. It was getting to that point. So I, I, I found you guys and I quit. So back, back to the beginning of when you were drinking, because I, I, again, I think it's an important point. Folks, listen to this, right? Here is somebody who's gone through his entire life where actually alcohol has not been um, pushed to him at a conscious level that it is normal and pleasurable because he's experiencing a lot of horrific things at a local level that are very personal to him. And then he kind of makes a vow that he's not going to drink. However, I think this is really important because he's consciously aware of this stuff and the negativity of alcohol that doesn't stop alcoholism as an invisible violent dominant belief system permeating his subconscious so so while you're thinking to yourself wow alcohol mm -hmm. shit and i hate it because my mum's just shouted and screamed at me and she's got drunk and i can't wake her up and i'm scared that she's dead right at the same time that's happening um robert redford drinking a, 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 a whiskey and smoking a cigarette uh, the um, Curious George book that you're reading to your stepkids has got a, a bloke with a pipe in his mouth. And all the marketing and the advertising, all the stuff you learned through school about all the kids drinking and all that kind of stuff, it's still there in, in the background telling you this, fuck is, this stuff is ace. But in mm -hmm. Andrew's case, he didn't succumb to it because, fortunately for him, there was shit going on in his life that was showing him a different side, which allowed him, when he had to deal with his cognitive dissonance, to quieten it by saying, I'm not going to drink this stuff rather than I'm going to. And then he turns uh, 28, 30, gets into a relationship, and now the blueprint kicks in. Because, and I'm saying blueprint because it sounds like you started to go, and, and you, can, you can comment on this in, in a sec. It sounds like you was in a relationship. It was going tits up. Mm -hmm. You needed some release from that relationship, and you turned to alcohol. Now, you would, yeah. only, you would only do that if you thought, that alcohol would be something that would give you a release. And the only way you could do that if you're not a drinker is that alcoholism as an invisible, violent and dominant belief system is imprinted upon you that that is something that's going to knock you the fuck out. Yeah. That's your escape. That's, that's, that's what your parents did. That's what society does. <sighs> have a drink. You take the edge off, sir. You know, you that's, take it. that's it. Your parents. That, yeah, that's it. That's what I grew up. I grew up and, and, and that's, that's what I saw. And my mom suffered every, every day, I'm assuming. But she was in so much pain. How did she relieve that pain? She drank. She drank to the point where she wouldn't wake up in the mornings at times. She didn't, she, she wasn't the person that she was. She lost herself because of alcohol. Say that again, say that again. She lost the person that she no, was. No, 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 before that. She I don't recall. <laughs> she wasn't the person that she was. Yeah. Hear that, folks. Hear that, folks. She wasn't the person she was, right? Now, Andrew's recently lost his mom. He's gone through a really tough time with, with that. But I think what he said there is really important because when it comes to becoming someone who doesn't drink alcohol, one of the things we need to confront is forgiveness because we are surrounded by people who drink because we are the outliers. We are the ones who see the truth about alcohol, right? But when those people around us are drinking, it's very difficult for us to coexist with them because they're trampling all over our values and they're getting in the way of our growth, especially if you're married to someone who's fucking bollocking it down their neck and you have to take care of them all the time, right? So it's important to look at them sometimes and say, wow, this is not who they really are. I know who I really am. I'm, I'm getting back to that person who I lost as a teenager. You are, Andrew. But these, these, these people around us who are drinking, they're not. And, and I think we need to find some love and some compassion and some empathy and some forgiveness there and look at them and say, wow, it wasn't that long ago I was in this state, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's easy to uh, judge when you're on the other side, isn't it? Mm. You know, I, we, we can't do that. Empathy is, uh, is, is not always easy to find, but when you find it, you have to give it, you know, um, 
it's it's so easy to to dislike a person because their 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 beliefs are different than than yours or they're doing things that you don't agree with but sometimes helping them is by listening to them and being empathetic and and looking past their their faults to show them a better way isn't it isn't it fantastically interesting though how you you go through life witnessing your parents self-destruction saying that you're not going to drink alcohol because you you're horrified about what it does and then at 30 you realize in that moment that actually i think i can find some value in this i this this horrific destruction that my parents were going through they were doing it for a reason to black out to like mm. block life out and i want to do that right now so yeah. that's what i know now yeah. think, think about that folks think about the power in that if you were drinking right now what is that doing to your children what what, what are your children's subconscious programming how is it working right now if 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 andrew at the age of 30 can suddenly think oh this worked for my parents yeah yeah and the kids see everything your kids see everything they see your good and your bad and the bad tends to leave more of an impression i find you know so we're all going to slip up we're all going to have our faults we're all going to screw up but the point for me is to, to to live consistently in a positive manner you know um develop a positive mindset develop a positive being or self just become positive and if you do slip up the kids are able to say Okay, I can forget about that slip up that mom or dad just had because ninety percent of the time they're really great people. I think I think if you're also if you if you are one of those parents, if you are a mindful, um, conscious parent, mm -hmm. then when you do slip up, you're going to sit down with that child and and apologize and explain what you've done wrong. And they'll accept it because they know that that's not the person you yes, are. Yes, uh, but I think conscious is the right word, actually, because when we're someone who drinks alcohol, we are unconscious most of the time. Like Andrew alluded to earlier on, you know, she yeah. wasn't the person she was because she was unconscious. She was a zombie. She was um, living through, like, procedural memory almost. Like, the we, we're just a husk. We're not alive. We're just... Yeah, the inner core is the inner core is wasting away due to this stuff. Yeah, and you have to rebuild once you decide to quit. It, it it doesn't come overnight. What I what I see on the on the on the forum and what I what I read is uh, people. Ex I don't know if people expect that it's going to be an overnight thing. You know that change is going to come right away. It doesn't. We have to rebuild ourselves. We tore ourselves down for years. It doesn't come back right away. And it doesn't come back because you want it to come back. You have to put in the work to get it, you know? And I don't know. That's, I feel like I'm just blabbering. Yeah, not blabbering. <laughs> when, when, when was the moment that you realized that your drinking had gone from uh, what we can say, quote, unquote, normal to, fuck, I've got a problem here? When my uh, ex-wife threw a coffee mug at my head. Mm. Did, it, did it hit? I don't know, but if it did, boy, I messed this up. All right. You know? But um, yeah, and you know what? I couldn't stop because I couldn't stop. I didn't want to stop. You know, I, 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 we are fighting every night. We, she, we, we, we are driving each other crazy and falling apart as individuals, but yet you don't want to put down the bottle because that gives you some sort of value. And for me, it's, it got me away mentally from the negative situation at the time, you know, eventually it just tore me down. Eventually I became a shell of the man that I was, you know, Patricia has been in my life for six years and I've only uh, found myself in the past year. I mean, what you say there is super important, I think, because if you're in a relationship that's going tits up and you've lost respect for each other and you're drinking alcohol, then why would you want to stop? Because if you think about it, continuing to drink allows you to be the worst part of yourself, allows you to be the, all the worst bits. It's and, your excuse. Yeah, but and then don't you want to show the worst bits to the person you really want to hurt? Mm -hmm. And if you're in a relationship that is full of conflict, no, let's cut the shit. You want to hurt that person. 
like when I'm in it, when I'm arguing with Liza, I want to hurt her. And, and, and so why would you want to quit drinking? It's only when you truly step up and get over your ego and say to yourself, you know, I really do love this person and I'm willing to sacrifice anything to be with them that you will, you will stop drinking. I, think it's I, also... I, I say this through experience because my ex-wife didn't stop drinking. Yeah. And the reason yeah. she, I always said, Oh my God, how could she, how could she choose a bottle of al uh, alcohol over me? But in truth, it was a lot, it was a lot more mm -hmm. nuanced than that. She wasn't happy in the relationship. So, so why should she, that. yeah. So why should she stop drinking? She wouldn't, she yeah. wasn't willing to sacrifice it for a relationship that was never going to work. You know, I think basically. it's also, it, it's, it's also case we, we want to start loving ourselves again, you know, and I quit because I wanted to start loving myself again. Mm. I didn't love myself for years. Mm. I mean, I let myself go. I, I, I had a little teeny, teeny waist and big, big shoulders and I was fit. I worked out six days a week until I was 30 years old, until the marriage came apart, um, until everything happened in the marriage. I was a healthy individual and I let myself go and I fell out of love with myself. I stopped learning. I stopped giving. I stopped caring for myself. I put on, I'm still, I'm still, uh, I'm loving myself now, but I'm still 21 stone. You know, it's a 292 pounds. It's 130 kilos. That's not loving yourself completely, but I started loving myself. I quit drinking and uh, I'm moving forward. It's a different challenge and you're, you're much able to be able to take on that challenge of shifting the extra weight when you're someone who doesn't drink alcohol compared to someone who's banging it down. Yeah, uh, because you're, you're, you, you don't wake up in a fog. You don't wake up um, just barely getting through the day until your next pint. You know, you're able to get up and you have focus and you have um, drive to do something if you choose to find it. Okay, so back then, you're in your first relationship. Uh, it's going tits up. Everything's getting a bit too much. You remember that your parents used to drink to block out that kind of shit. You don't want to deal with it. So you drink to escape from life. Andrew, yeah. Andrew, Andrew, I am sure today you still have times when you don't want to deal with life and you want to block yourself out, but you mm -hmm. don't drink alcohol. Now, if mm -hmm. alcohol had that much value and was so wonderful at doing that, then you would drink alcohol. So... Why don't you drink alcohol when you're struggling with life now and you want to black out? And what do you do in those times when you want to black out and stop the voices and run the fuck away from life? Ah, uh, the answer is your message, sir, works. Alcohol. What is that message? For me, alcohol. Listen, you're going to put me on the spot and make me rehash and, or, or put things in the exact grammatical. No, no. Oh. As you, as you, <laughs> as you, as you, as you feel alcohol gives me no value at all it took away my clarity it took away drive it took away desire it took away it robbed me in so many ways it took my money i was eating mustard sandwiches when i was in vancouver because i would rather buy beer than eat mm. okay um it took away so much and your message or the message that we have here at strive just it resonated i'm not i'm not a smart i'm not i'm not a tremendously uh, intelligent person sometimes it's just the simplest thing that resonates with me and that's it it gives me no value so i quit i had my father die in january i had my mother die in july i watched them both die feet away from me alcohol still means nothing to me because it provides no value what I what I've done to replace it is I challenge myself. I have goals. I have desires. I focus on learning and growing every day, be it mentally. Well, now it's mentally because I'm still lazy. Um, but I want to grow. I want to be of service. I want to help. And you can't do that if you're drinking, folks. It's simple. I'm not. I'm not a well thought out person. It's simple for me. I can't. I can't. I'm not very in depth. It's no, just, I you no are you uh, ignore him folks he's talking to the <laughs> <laughs> if anybody ever reads anything that andrew posts on strive he's a very deep person um i'm not you are think i of, just talk from the heart that is deep people don't talk from the heart the heart um, the heart is it one of the deepest places in your body that's all i have the heart and the gut and the brain um yeah you know think of what andrew said then so he he went through a real tough relationship 
okay, and then a divorce or a separation, or whatever. And um, drunk alcohol because he thought it gave him the value, the perceived value that it was going to let it help him escape from that relationship, right? Which which is bullshit because every time he woke up, his relationship was still there and his problems were still there. <laughs> um, but then when he um, goes through the horrific circumstances that he has recently of losing both his parents in quick succession, which is um, going to be at minimum on parallel, but I imagine a lot, lot worse than going through a relationship breakup with someone you don't like. Yeah. He's not drinking and he manages to cope and care for them all throughout that time period. Um, go to show for me the power in someone who doesn't drink alcohol compared to the absolute fuck, fucked up chaos of being someone who does drink alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 I'm still emotional uh, when it comes to my, my parents. I, I'm still, I'm very sad. Mm. But I don't need to compound misery by adding more misery through alcohol. You know, that's the message for me is I don't need to, I'm, I'm going through so much heartache right now. I don't need to add to it. And that's all alcohol will do. It doesn't give you anything. It doesn't give me anything. It doesn't give people anything. But we have to realize that for ourselves. But people will be listening to this, Andy, and they'll be saying, you know, I read, I listen to podcasts, I exercise, I love myself, I try to love myself, but I still can't stop drinking alcohol, right? What What is it about stride the truth of alcohol you what is it that you go from someone who's drunk alcohol for a decade or so to someone who believe in it has tremendous value to someone who doesn't drink it and thinks it has no value like how is that possible i i don't think i ever put value on alcohol i think I think I just used it as a masking agent. I, I used it to numb myself to the pain. I, I didn't see it as, hey, this is giving me, you know, like you guys are, you know, it's giving me social status. It's, it's allowing me to fit in. I drank by myself at night to, 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 to mask the pain up until the last day. You but that's your, va that's your value though, right? So your, va yeah. your, value, your value is I don't want to deal with his pain. Alcohol is going to remove it. That is the value. But at the end, it was causing me to, I couldn't drive on the highway. I couldn't. It was giving me no more value. It was taking away uh, from my relationship with uh, Patricia, especially. So and, the, more, uh, the more the more you were drinking, uh, I think I, I, you, I remember you right. It was creating a instinct. You were drinking to kind of remove the anxiety, but it was actually I, increasing your anxiety. I, I, I live, Montreal is an island. I live off the island. I have to go through, a, go across a bridge. We have a tunnel. We have two bridges. I was running out of options. I couldn't take the bridges and I was afraid of the tunnel. I couldn't get to work. And I was coming home and Patricia was, was, was she never saw me drink because I would drink when she went to bed, but she would see me the next morning and throughout the day. And I wasn't myself until maybe seven o'clock at night when I started to get my senses back. And then she was in bed by nine o'clock, you know, and I work six days a week. I still do. So we had that one day and I was, you know, sloshed most of the day, you know, from the night before. So I, I just had to take stock and say, what is, it, what is it giving me? It's taking away so much right now that it's not worth it. The value left when I realized the hurt I was putting on somebody that I love. I still think we need to pad this out a little bit. So, okay. so I guess I'm not getting it. No, you will get it. I'll keep prodding you until you get it. So you start really questioning why you're drinking, mm -hmm. okay? You start saying to yourself, this is giving me more pain than it is giving me pleasure, okay? Which is one of the first facets if you're gonna try and quit drinking alcohol, be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, folks. The reason you're drinking is because you believe the value that alcohol is providing you is far greater pleasure than the pain you get in from drinking it, right? And you need to reverse that and get more pain um, out of the situation as opposed to pleasure, right? So that's, 
That's one thing that Andrew's doing. But still, that in itself is nowhere near going to be good enough for the vast amount of people who are really struggling drinking alcohol, okay? Mm -hmm. Then, Andrew, you must have got onto the computer and looked for help because how on earth did you end up on Strive? Through you, through the podcast. I listened to you. Oh, I heard right, you. right. So why did you start listening to podcasts? Because I knew I had a problem, mate. Okay, so you get on and you start listening and you listen to me on the podcast. So, so mm. again, you have to seek help. So another thing that you did, you, you started looking for help. Yeah. But what, what was it about the podcast that turned you on to Strive? Your message. The fact that you had, um, had been in my shoes and you were able to make something of yourself. You know, you, you took a big risk uh, by quitting your job, your, 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 your safety net. You removed that safety net, but you still managed to move forward and be of service to others. And I thought, geez, if this guy, if this guy can, can take away his safety net and probably shit scared by doing so, but yet he's there to help people and his message resonates with me and his demeanor resonates with me and... That was it, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. So another really valuable point here. We're, we're, we're piecing it together slowly together, and right. So another important point is, we, Andy alluded it to earlier on, right? If we hang around with a bunch of dickheads, we're going to turn into a dickhead, right? Um, we need to surround ourselves with people who we aspire to become, mm -hmm. or who we believe we can learn a great deal from, in order for us to. Um, uh, benefit from that energy, benefit from the enthusiasm, their inspiration, their sweat, their tears, uh, their joy, their lessons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes, uh, one of my uh, heroes is David Beckham, right? Sometimes these heroes can be too far removed from us, right? Oh, mm -hmm. can I really be David Beckham? The guy's a fucking multi gazillionaire, best looking bastard in the world. Can I really be David Beckham, right? No, not really, right? But if you look at then someone like me, just a working class scumbag who just swears a lot and, and really screws up a lot and upsets his wife and he's not the greatest dad all the time, um, but he managed, he managed to do this stuff, then suddenly you can be like, oh, well, maybe I can be like this guy. Mm -hmm. you know. So I think that is super important. Um, so then you come to Strive. Yeah. So people come to Strive all the time and, and fuck off. Like loads of people come to Strive and go. Why did you stay? Maybe because it was my, what I felt was my rock bottom. I, I, I didn't want to exist in that state anymore. And I found a group of like-minded uh, fellows and ladies and gentlemen that, that were striving to better themselves and to quit. And it's just, it was, it, it, from the first week that I was on there, it was just a good place to be. And that's what helped me quit and I just had enough Lee I had enough it did it, I saw what it did to my mom I saw what it, it essentially killed my dad because he couldn't stop drinking until he was in the hospital because the, the fluids would eventually end up in his lungs um I was it's just a place to be for me like I said I'm not deep it was just it resonated with me your message the people on the site at the time we were helping each other and it was a good vibe it was a good place to be and I was ready. I was ready. So you, you surround yourself with people who see you, hear you. I think something else happened that you haven't explored when you was on Strive that I think is super important that people should bear in mind. Because I recently changed the... It used to be called the Truth About Alcohol Life Changing Experience. We made it the Truth About Alcohol Life Changing Experience Vision 2. We're now merging that into the first Truth About Alcohol Intensive that starts on Sunday. Um, and I included the check-in process as being like a really fundamental mm. part of that and the help and guidance as well and, and using Strive in order for you to create this uh, muscle of sharing of being vulnerable. But one of the things that Andrew used Strive for, in my opinion, and I hope he's not going to kind of <laughs> shoot me down in flames in a minute, um, as an observer of Strive, is that Andrew helps people. So Andrew comes on Strive and he is, you can tell that he is not prepared to give a throwaway comment to somebody who is bearing their soul on Stripe. 
yes, if someone posts a picture of their holiday um, uh, view, and, and Andrew might say, great view. But if someone is on there saying, I'm having a fucking bad day, um, I'm really struggling with the kids, or I'm really struggling with my wife or something, Andrew never gives a one-sentence response. You can tell that he goes away, he thinks about it for a long time, and then he provides empathy and support. And in my opinion, his ability to do that and the vehicle and the platform that he has to do that means that he becomes invested uh, with these people and the right hormones and neurochemicals that he needs floating around his body to supplement his new uh, psychological uh, experience and understanding of the truth about alcohol is there because he's helping people. He's giving service. He's, He's no longer the weird fucking kid in, in school that people picked on and didn't want to fucking be like. He doesn't have to bully people in order for him to get approval. All he has to do is help people change their lives and change their lives in a way that he knows how to do because he's fucking done it. And all of a sudden, he has purpose, he has meaning, he has a place. Okay? And that then yeah. is like an Indiana Jones boulder of momentum that just keeps going and going and going. Um, and that is... What's happening with Andrew right now? Um, sermon over. <laughs> Essentially, you know what? It gives, it feeds, it feeds my ego, if, if, if you want to say it. Yeah. It, it, it helps me as much as I, I, I help, you know? It really does. And I, one of the greatest things that, that, that I've gotten from my, my, my mother is, is empathy. Um, I feel for these people. And you're right. If if I don't I don't want to just you know write shit because I'm writing shit. I I I feel for these people because they're struggling. You know, I feel for everybody on strike. You know, and if you're willing to invest yourself, I'll invest myself as well. It's just as simple as that. Because it, it's a it helps me. Yeah, it helps me. I mean, we're here to help each other. Geez. No, not just that though, because it's a family. What is a family? Right, we've all been in families. Families very often are not, right? We're shouting and fucking screaming at each other. We disagree with each other. We don't like each other very much. You know, that's not in my family. But, but there's, a, a, there's a respect, there's a love, there's a I will do anything for you. Uh, I feel like we, we are growing that. And, and, and here's yeah. a funny thing about Strive. Um, we have a core group of us who've been there from the beginning, but a lot of people come and go. We have like ebbs and flows of groups, but the core framework and the value system that we have is, is super duper important. And, Andrew used the word ego there. Like, it helps my ego. Now, a lot of people are afraid of that word ego, right? So I'm going to replace that word ego with another word that people might be comfortable with, and that is status, and we talked about it earlier on. When you come to strive, you are feeling like you're low down on the pecking order, this dominance hierarchy, this status. But when you come to strive and you start helping people, because your ego is getting a bit of a bunce, you start to increase in status particularly on strife. And then when you go to work or you or you're in, in the pub or you where your mates were, you, you know that you're helping people. Yeah. What yeah. better what better way? I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying Andrew is either one of those, but they, in terms of the status hierarchy where they were, was very, very high up. And that's very, very important to us as human beings. Like Yeah, yeah. You want to give back. You want to you you, you, you want to feed into the cycle of basically you're helping people are helping you and, and i mean that's just the way it goes if you want to feel good in life if you want to feel good in life be of service to others help others you know and in that in in doing so you're helping yourself you're growing for me no no i i think it's a uh, an absolute crucial building block for anybody who wants to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol is to find a group of people that you feel really comfortable with and then help those people you know yeah. I, I i really do think that is super important yeah i, I agree 100% so you know we we, we have our road we have the road ahead that uh, i think we'll be on the same page for a long time to come um andrew what would you say um give some Give some advice to people, a couple of nuggets on your journey. Um, someone now is listening to this. They're really fucking struggling. They cannot stop drinking. They've had a million day ones. Give them a little bit of advice, please. I can only speak to, to, to what helped me. And the advice that I would give is you have to realize and you have to open your eyes and ask yourself, 
what does alcohol really give me in my life? Does it give me happiness or does it take away from essentially my life that I'm trying to lead? We only have one of them. And if we're, if, if, if we're, if we're going sideways all the time and not enjoying the limited time that we have, it's not worth it. So if you want to quit and you're at that point, just just as, as uh, Julian put it the other day, play the movie out in your head from beginning to end. See how that drink will take you to the next day through the years, whatever, and ask yourself, what value does it really give me? And if it doesn't give you any value or if it only provides negative, then ask yourself if you want that in your life. Play the movie. I like that one. As Julian, it's not me. Well then, Julian, that could that could become part of our toolkit because in the in the new Truth About Alcohol Intensive, which is going to be a, an annual subscription, so we'll be working together as a group for a year. Um, we're going to create a toolkit, so I think that's really important. Um, I'm just going to run and get something. You wait there a second. Okay, so I'll sing to the people. Hello, people. Ta-da! Okay, he's back. I'm there back. Go. I got this book. I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we're going to, and then I'm going to ask you three random questions and put you on the spot. Um, oh, Andrew is a true about alcohol moderator. So Andrew, uh, you've heard his his life story or his snippets of his life story. Then he turns up at Strive. He starts helping everybody out and being a regular. Uh, uh, correspondent on Strive takes a truth about alcohol life changing experience, which is now going to be called the truth about alcohol intensive. Okay, and then I say, Do you know what, Andy? I think you have all the attributes uh, that I need to support this mission uh, to create a movement of millions of people that don't drink alcohol. And and Andrew is now a truth about alcohol moderator. Um, how does it feel to be a moderator? What, 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 how do you feel about the whole thing? Just tell the truth, be honest. And what would your advice be to people who want to be a moderator at some point? It feels great to be a moderator. It feels great to be a role model in a sense. Uh, to, for me, I, I like having that responsibility on my shoulders uh, to lead the example, to, to show people that you can, you can be at the bottom and you can make you make your way up i still don't have much in life but i have happiness and i have fulfillment through helping others so if you find yourself alcohol free when you're ready to quit when you do quit and you want to be a moderator just think of the fact that you're you're helping other people get out of where you came from you know you're you're making an impact on other people's lives and it's not just their lives it's the lives of the people that they are surrounded with and that is a huge thing for me. And it's a pleasure having you, brother. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm going to put you on a spot. I'm going to ask you three random questions. Uh, if you don't want to answer them, just say pass. Okay. No comment. Or I plead the fifth. Choose uh, a number between 1 and 127. 17. 17. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Pick a number between one to seven. Seven. Whose yeah. smile can you most easily persuade or seduce you? Whose smile can most easily persuade or seduce you? Patricia's. I knew he was going to say that. It's true. Why? Because I love her. Ah, uh, Patricia is uh, Andrew's other half, by the way. Pick another number between 1 and 127. 27. 27. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Ooh, 1 to 7 again. Pick another 1 to 7. I'll pick 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. What is the most difficult confession you've ever had to make? Oh, jeez. What is the most difficult confession that I ever had to make? The telling Patricia I was an alcoholic. She didn't know. She knew I drank. She didn't know how much I drank. Mm, that must have I, would been drink, tough. I would drink at night. Sorry. That's okay. I would drink. I would drink at night by myself to black out nightly. And she didn't know. She knew a little bit, but I would hide. You know, we hide. We hide the bottle. 
I hid the bottles. I hid everything. They're telling her. That was hard. Sorry, folks. Got to be a Viking. Rah. Vikings. <laughs> Vikings. Vikings cry. I'm there sure it. they do. I've seen the show. <laughs> You look, you, you look more like a Viking when you take your glasses off. Oh, geez, yeah, but the bags uh, say otherwise. <laughs> All oh. right, I got two more questions. This, uh, this last uh, roulette was we're doing here, and then I got one final question. Pick a number one, two, one, two, seven. Uh, take uh, number 42, please. 42, so a butcher's, what's 42 here? Uh, say one to seven. I'll take number three, please. Oh. Don't put that tissue down yet. Um, when in your life have you felt... Oh, Jesus. When in your life have you felt the loneliest? In Vancouver. I had my brother who lived a couple miles away from me. Can you leave? Um, I was alone. I was in a place where I was, I was just trying to hide from the world and... Uh, I was by myself and at rock bottom. I, I would hide. I would hide. I would hide in my house. I wouldn't go out. I'd go to work and that was it and then come back and just hide. And um, that for me was the loneliest. I was in one of the most beautiful places in the world, but yet I never went out. You never saw it. No. Ten years. Oh. Um, and finally, before I let you go, Andrew, you've been an absolute star. How does alcohol make you feel? Now, doesn't make me feel anything. I don't drink it, but I hate it. Yeah! Oh, <laughs> get the Viking out. <laughs> now I want to see the Viking. <laughs> there we go, sir. Yeah, I yeah, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And you made me cry, you bastard. <laughs> I love your little... Uh, there was a bit of Scottishness came out in you there. Andrew, I just want to end by uh, showing you some gratitude and appreciation. I want to say thank you very much for sharing your story with us, for being so open, so vulnerable, and being such a leader uh, at the Truth About Alcohol and Strife movement. We, uh, we missed you for a period of time when you weren't there, but we understood why you had to, uh, to be absent and to deal with your stuff. And it's great to have you back. And if any of you ever get the opportunity to work uh, with Andrew in the Truth About Alcohol Taster or the Truth About Alcohol Intensive. You're a very lucky man or woman. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You know what? You're a star. And I said it to you a year ago. You, 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 right there. You changed my life, okay? I had to put in the work, but it was your message that got through. I'm, Thank glad, you. It got, I'm glad it got through. Right, Thank we'll you. both be crying in a minute. All right, yeah, I'd like to see it, sir. Take care. All right, brother.